This great institution has helped to shape black history by creating outstanding scholars, by creating outstanding practitioners, by creating and shaping strong communities that have given life to, supported, and advanced black history in our nation and beyond our borders. So while we know what it means to celebrate black history, for us, that's really just a celebration of what we do each and every day. Because our students, our faculty, our graduates, our alums, our employees, and all of the other members of the Morgan family, we work each and every day to make a difference as it relates to black history, American history, and international history. So give yourselves a round of applause for the work that you do. I wanna to say to you that we will continue to do what we have done because we understand the importance of continuing progress. We understand the importance of ensuring that we continue to shape the future of black history. For we know that the future of black history rests in our hands and we'll continue to be leaders among those individuals who are working fearlessly each and every day to make a difference. I wanna thank the faculty. I wanna thank the staff members. I wanna thank our students. I wanna thank our alums that I had an opportunity to meet and I wanna thank those alums that I haven't had an opportunity to meet. And I also want to thank our community partners that are here today to celebrate with us as well. I want to thank you for the work that you do, and I want to thank you for the work that you'll continue to do. And I also want to thank you for your passion, for your purpose that helps to continue to ensure the progress of black history and the progress of individuals that will shape black history, not only today, but for the many, many, many years to come. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for who you are. And thank you for the commitment that you continue to make. Let's celebrate black history today and let's continue to shape black history each and every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Crumpton Young. Um, just want to let you guys know that this is no ordinary convocation. We don't want to just talk at you guys, but we really want to encourage an engaging conversation. So if you guys have any thoughts or any ideas that you guys would like to jot down after the interview that we will be having, please feel free. We will also have a question and answer portion afterwards, and we'd love to hear from the voice of the students to hear. There's so much knowledge and so much history in this room alone that we could all learn from. So hopefully you guys don't leave the same way I came in here today. Um, at this time, if you guys could fix your eyes to the screen to watch this video here. To watch this video that was produced by Professor Albert Morgan from the School of Global Journalism.
All right. Thank you to Professor Albert Morgan. Um, also, if you guys are on Twitter, um, are we have a social media hashtag for, uh, that we want to push, which is hashtag Morgan BLK History. Sorry, excuse me. Hashtag Morgan, capital B L K History 2020. So if you guys have any tweets or anything that you guys want to share, let's not let all this information stay within these four walls, but let's push this through social media so that we can reach further lengths. Um, so without further ado, the time we've all been waiting for, and if you guys have your programs, you can see on the inside of the program, we have a biography about our interviewer, our interviewee, and I briefly want to go over it before we introduce him. Clarence M. Dunneville Jr. was born during the Great Depression in the city of Roanoke, Virginia. He fought segregation as a child refusing to abide by Jim Crow laws. He excelled at school, skipped two grades, and graduated from Lucy Addison High School at age 16. Dunneville then left Southwest Virginia to attend Morgan State College. As a Morgan student, Dunneville actively participated in nonviolent civil rights protests. In December 1953, Thurgood Marshall arranged for him to attend the oral arguments of Brown versus Board of Education. This experience inspired Dunneville to study law and work to end racial discrimination. After graduating from Morgan in 1954, he studied law at St. John's University School of Law in Brooklyn, New York, graduating with honors in 1957. In 1965, Dunneville became AT&T's first African-American attorney. Throughout his career with AT&T, he held many important positions. While employed with AT&T, Dunneville was still devoted to civil rights. He served as a volunteer attorney with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law in Mississippi. He was the New York Executive Director of Interracial Council for Business Opportunities for Business Opportunity. Dunneville also co-founded the Council of Concerned Black Executives and the Association for Integration in Management. Both organizations worked with AT&T with major corporations to develop executives and promote their upward mobility during the 1970s and 1980s. Dunneville is an author of numerous articles on law and justice. He's a life member of NAACP, a member of Alpha Beta Bull, and Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated, and if you didn't catch it before, a graduate of the greatest university in the world, Morgan State University. Let's give a warm Morgan State welcome to Mr. Clarence M. Dunneville, Jr. I am home. I first entered this place 70 years ago, 7-0. I just turned 17. <laughs> my, 16, my 17th birthday was about two weeks before I came here on my own. I had left home. I worked uh, since I was 12 to save up enough money. My father died when I was 11, and my mother had five children, so I was definitely on my own. And I arrived at Morgan, I had $5,000 in cash, if you can believe it, which was a huge amount of money. I paid my tuition, which was maybe 3,500, I don't remember specifically, and I had enough money left for my room and board. But when I found out, I got here, I found out there was no room for me on the campus. And I figured I only had about 1,500 left to last me for the whole semester. And if I lived in town, I had to eat out in restaurants, I would not have enough money. So I went to the dean of, of uh, men, men's dean, and I pleaded with him. And he put an extra bed, bed in one of the rooms three, to give three people in the room. And I was my star here at age 17. And I was 
Uh, I was mentioned I graduated from uh, Lucy Addison in Roanoke. I did. But since I was working and, and trying to save to come to college and all that, my mother had five children, uh, I was terrible as a student. And frankly, I graduated from Lucy Addison, thank the Lord. <laughs> yes, but because of Morgan, the excellent professors, I wound up magna cum laude. Hope, yes, <laughs> yes, that's a fact. And I think I was third in the class. I don't know, somebody can check it. But I wasn't, I, that was about where I was. Magna cum laude, uh, high in the class. And I received the President's Second Mile Award. And I left to go on to uh, law school as it was mentioned, I was inspired uh, by my trip to the Supreme Court, which Dr. A.J. Walker, and I bet his niece here, uh, he arranged uh, through Thurgood Marshall. And at that time, uh, we arrived there in the morning, and um, there was a huge, huge line all the way down the steps, uh, the line was like five, or five to six abreast, and it was went all the way to the street. It was maybe um, a thousand, thousand, maybe more than a thousand people waiting to get in. And I said, Dr. Walker, we'll never get in. <laughs> and he said, wait, wait, wait. And lo and behold, we had the tickets, and this was December, and there were people who slept out there on the Supreme Court steps uh, overnight. It was a huge, huge uh, group of people. And as I got there, I looked up, and if any of you had a chance to visit the Supreme Court, you will see on the top of the Supreme Court, it says, equal justice under law. And I looked at that, and I looked at all these people, and I was just a teenager, and I said, I'm going to see what I can do about that. And I spent my whole lifetime trying to do something about it. It's been a small contribution, but it made a few dents, I think. Mr. But Donabel, can we have the, the, the interview start? Yes, I just wanted to give uh, that overview. Mm -hmm. um, and one of two other things I wanted to say before the interview okay. started, if I can. Um, that trip really was the inspiration, I think, for what I've done since that time. And then um, I want to just acknowledge my family who's here. Uh, and all the support I've gotten from my family over the years. And to say this is Black History Month, and the theme of that is to vote and make sure you do. Uh, and one other thing I want to acknowledge, my cousin, Theodore Patterson, who was a great uh, leader here in the, um, the core and the amount of, uh, we opened, we were the, Morgan was the very first school play, school in the nation that opened lunch counters, the first. And that was led by my cousin Theodore Patterson and Dr. McQuaykai. And I really wanted to acknowledge that because that's something that's not well known in history. People talk about the people from North Carolina, but um, we were first. And we did that in 1952, if you just think of it. That was 68 years ago. So uh, 
I want to just make those points because I wasn't sure if I would be able to do that through the interviews. But yes, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. So I just want to say on behalf of myself and my fellow Morganites, we really do appreciate the contribution that you put towards the civil rights movement and just bringing activism to Morgan's campus. So with that being said, I just want to know what can we do as a student body to bring that same spirit back to campus as far as being involved in voting, making sure everybody is a registered voter, making sure they are paying attention to what's going on outside of this campus? What can we do to put ourselves in a position that you've been in? Well, I think that the first thing that you need to do is to have faith in yourself. Morgan is great, it has a great history. And I've spoken about the history uh, in the handout that I prepared uh, if you could just imagine, Morgan was founded two years after slavery ended and before the 14th Amendment or the 15th Amendment were ratified. So when Morgan was founded, black people, although slaves were freed, black people had no rights, zero. And the rights that came to black people were from the 14th and 15th Amendment uh, after Morgan was founded. Now, with respect to what you can do today, you can remember that history when you, you yourself become courageous and take on what's left all these years since Morgan was founded, 1967 until today, Morgan has been at the forefront, leading in the struggle, because it's been a struggle. And you, as Morgan students, have to take on the struggle. Yes, you do. There's plenty of work to be done. You look around and you see what's going on nationally with uh, the Trump administration, and uh, they're trying to take away all of the rights that we have earned. So yes, courage, you, ha you have to believe in yourself, and you have to believe in change. So what encouraged you, as well as the other students who were here, to be in a position where you can go to Brown versus Board? How was the campus life? What was administration like? How did you find yourself witnessing history? Well, I think that was the faculty. And I see Walter Gill sitting there. And his father, Dr. Robert L. Gill, was very inspirational. Uh, I saw somewhere, yes, Dr. A.J. Walker's niece. Uh, those faculty members, they were inspirational. And the whole spirit of Morgan then was we can do it. We're going to make a change. Now, remember, 1950, it was really in the very beginning of the civil rights struggle before Brown, uh, but people, there was this fundamental uh, feeling at Morgan that you had throughout the, the campus that we can make a change. And I think it was mostly that, because as I said before, they took me from thank you, thank you, Lord, to magna cum Lord. <laughs> and it was Morgan that did it. It was the spirit of Morgan. And that has been a spirit throughout Morgan's history. But it was the faculty, yes, and the spirit there. OK. And for the students who may not, 
know how powerful we are. What can you say to those students who don't know the role that we play in society and they feel like it's okay to just sit back and just let everything happen? What can you say to those students who don't really know how powerful we are as black students? Well, we're very powerful if you think about it. Morgan became a state school, I don't remember the year, but in 1947, it was a state school. And the resources were not there. He, given money to University of Maryland, the state was, and all the white schools, and very little, a few crumbs to Morgan. And the students organized, yes, in 1947 and 48, and they went up to Annapolis, and they took on the state. That was courageous then, and the students were courageous when I was here, and the students that followed me were courageous. Now, what could we do? They could, you could look at those examples and know that students are powerful, and we have the right we can do it, we can organize, and we can do a lot of things as students that maybe even adults can't do. But you have the power, you can do it. And thinking about the other students who you were involved with um, at the time, what are some of the things that they've accomplished due to their activism during the years at Morgan? Well, I could talk about my cousin Theodore, for example, because he was an example. Theodore graduated from here in 1954. I'm just using him as an example, but he's a good example. And he went into the ROTC, he was in ROTC and went in the Army. And when he came out, he became, I think, the second or third graduate of the University of Maryland Medical School. And then he went on to Turner Station, which is anybody here from Turner Station? Or Dundalk? Henrietta Lacks. No, but anyway, he went out there, you know where it is. And he became a great doctor and community leader and he led that community because health was one of the big issues for black people, especially people there who were mostly poor. And there are many examples, and I'm not uh, familiar with a lot of them and don't remember because it was a long time ago, but that's an example of what the Morgan students have done. They have gone into communities and taking leadership roles. And I speak of uh, Baron Mitchell. I think I saw his, was his picture mm -hmm. up there? The first one. Well, you can look at him, for example. You can see what he's done. There are many more, but uh, time will not permit me and I don't have them in mind. But you cannot just sit back, you have to do it you have to take, take it on your own. You have to do it. So you started answering the next question I was gonna ask. What do you want us to gain from our experience here in 2020? Times have changed, things have changed, but it's still things that have to be done. What are we supposed to be gaining from this experience here at Morgan? Well, you, you know from being here, and you were looking around, and you see what's going on. I drove through Baltimore uh, on my way over here this morning. And I looked around and I saw there are a lot of places that are not, uh, they're run down, sure. But then when I got here, I know that this area 15 years ago was also run down. And Morgan has made a difference. But you can make a difference yourself because by acting, just by acting, 
uh, you can change America, you can change Baltimore, and you can change Maryland by your own actions. You can look, if you live in a block where it's kind of run down, or you know of a block run down, you can take it on as a project. There's unlimited things that you can do as a student. You just have to be courageous and innovative and want to have, uh, be a student of change. Okay. Part of this convocation is dedicated to Dr. Quarles, which we see was a major figure in African American history and spreading that knowledge. Why is it still important that we pay attention to history, especially our own history? A lot of students kind of run away from it because they think it's boring or it's not something that matters anymore. Why should we still focus on it today? Well, first I want to say that Dr. Quarles was one of my favorite professors. Mm -hmm. Yes. And could we have a round of applause for Dr. Quarles? <laughs> yes, he was a great professor, and he was a great teacher, and he is a great author. I've got at least four or five of his books that are published. Uh, so I, I'm glad that they're dedicating this session to him because he made a great contribution to Morgan and a great contribution to Maryland and a great contribution to black history. His books are all on black history from the Civil War to, I, I don't remember all of them, but I've got them at home. And um, it was a great contribution that he made to black history. And I think there is no other uh, person in Maryland, certainly, uh, who made that kind of contribution to black history. Or he made, made, he's made a, nationally, he's made a great contribution to black history because of the work he's done and the research he's done. And he went back into uh, slavery, but further back than slavery. And he has made a tremendous contribution through the original research that he's done. So yes, Dr. Quarles, uh, he's made a contribution that is tremendous. And uh, I'm so proud that I was one of his students and that he's recognized in this program and, and in Black History Month because he was a maker of black history he was a student of black history, and he was a black history great. Okay. Oh, all right, at this time, while they're continuing the interview, if any students would have any questions that they would like to ask their interviewee, you guys can meet me up here on front. We can line up against this wall so we can ask questions. So I know I mentioned earlier, if you guys were taking notes, have any questions you guys want to ask, please feel free to line up over here, and the mic will be ready for you guys. And I just want to emphasize, this man is filled with knowledge and a lot of things to share. So even if you feel like you're nervous or you don't want to ask a question, you can ask almost anything, and I guarantee he'll have the answer. So please don't hesitate and come up and ask a few questions. So just taking it back a little bit to the importance for my generation to make sure we are doing what we have to do as American people. How can we start making his, like learning history interesting and making it something that everybody wants to do and it isn't forced upon us by our professors and things like that? Well, I think if you read history, I don't know how many of you are, uh, well, Morgan requires history doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it should if it doesn't. It really should as a required course. I think it was required when I was here. I think it was. And it should be required. I think black history should be required. Certainly. Yep. It should. And I don't know who makes up the curriculum, <laughs> but I'm saying this morning 
that black history should be required as a required course. And I think it should be freshmen that should take it, or maybe it'd be sophomores. So I think if it was required, that you could get a flavor for where we've come. And that would give you, that would give you an incentive to take it to the next level. Yes. You got to look and see where you've come from, people, to, uh, students. <laughs> you do. Our first question, say your name and classification. All right. Hello, my name is Langston Dansby. My classification is freshman, and I have a question about our current state right now. I know you brought up that we have to do something we shouldn't be uh, just sitting down and being a, a bystander, but what issues do you see today playing uh, our community? Well, uh, there are a lot of them I would talk about. Uh, first, I'm really sorry that Congressman Elijah Cummings passed away. Uh, can we have a moment of silence for him? Yes, please do. I would speak about Dr. Cummings in connection with your question. Big, not Dr. Cum Congressman Cummings. Uh, he was also a part, of course, of the Morgan community. He was not a graduate, but uh, he was a part. He was, uh, wasn't he the chairperson of the board? Of this, do you call it the board of this? Yes. And he was really a strong supporter of Morgan. And as to as a to, as a freshman, uh, think of people like Elijah Cummings, Parent Mitchell, and Pume. Yes, didn't he just win the election? Won the primary. Yes, well, won that's primaries. election. <laughs> now, that in itself should give you some. Courage as a freshman. You he see, was asking, are there some issues you would like them to focus on? Yes, but that's, that's what I'm getting to. The issues that you're going to focus on is, first of all, you're going to look at those people that I enumerated and say, what do they do? And then you're going to look at yourself, and you're going to say, where can I go? And then the issues that you're going to take on are the issues of Maryland. Now, what are the issues that Maryland has? Housing, yes. Industry, getting more industry here, yes. Employment, yes. Uh, police problems, yes. You can go down the list of all the problems that Maryland has. They are not unique to Maryland or Baltimore, but you have to focus on these issues. Now, can one person focus on all of them? Maybe not. But as a freshman, you should think about those. Yes, I think. And what can I do? I learned a little poem in kindergarten. <laughs> really? Kindergarten? <laughs> and it says, one small stone and then another, and then the greatest wall is made. Now, you're a small stone, one person, freshman. But if you look around you, that's all you have to do and see what's needed. And then you can take on your share. And you can look at the issues. And I think if you do that, you can give up. Do you have anything else you want to ask? No, I believe you answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Another question? 
Hello, my name is Mecca Hussein. I'm a sophomore. Um, I have like two questions for you. So the first one is, I would like to know your favorite, one of your favorite memories here at Morgan. And the second one is just like your views, your points, and anything you want to touch on as far as on the Northwood um, Center and how it was back in the day. You know, we own it now, but it was a big part. You know, they had it segregated and the wall was built. And, you know, it's funny how times change now that we own it, so. So I'm sorry, I didn't get your North question. Board? Yes. Okay. So the second uh, part of my question was well, about. Well, this one was the first. The first part was favorite memories. Correct. Favorite memories of being at Morgan. Oh gee. <laughs> I think. I think. I'll be honest. I'll tell you the memories. You know, we had a lot of fun, and we were. You know, we had a lot of parties, and we had a lot of uh, dances, and it was. Yes, I remember those things. I was, I was not just a guy who uh, was in the dorm st studying. <laughs> we, we, we had a good time, yes. Trust me, we know. And, and the fraternity parties, and we, yes, we had a good time. And you should too. <laughs> Don't give that up because it's not necessary. Enjoy it. College is for enjoyment. So those are the memories, and I still have them. The other was, question was about Northwood. Had it been built when you were still a student here? Yes. Okay. And let me talk about Northwood. Thank you for bringing it up. When we got here, Northwood, the housing, which was all the way down where we are now, I think, just looking at it, and the theater was down there somewhere. And they had not built the theater yet. The theater, I think, was completed about 1952. That's my recollection. I could be wrong. Morgan students began picketing that theater in 1960, 1952, whenever it was built. To get in, we were denied. And the, my brother sitting here, he went to Morgan, I think, around 1963. 61. 60, 61. 60, oh, I went too far off. <laughs> and they were still picketing. Think of it. Almost 10 years. More than 10. Yeah. Because when he left, they hadn't thought, started stop picketing yet. And the way it worked was my class picketed, the class after me picketed, the class after us picketed, and the class later picked it. It was continuous. And we had four siblings that attended. I was first, then my sister who, who passed away, she was second. My other sister was third, he was last. And we were picketing all those years. So Northwood was here, it was built up, it was racist, it was all white, there were all white people living here. Among us, we were just a little uh, uh, clove, I guess you'd say, uh, in, in, uh, in the midst of all these things. There was a segregated lunch counter to reach up the street, and that is the way this Northwood section was then. And we have, over the years, it became run down, and now it's back. So it was Morgan who brought it back. Anything else? I can help. This will be our last question here. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Roberta Harlan. I'm a freshman majoring in political science. And um, first, I just want to uh, uh, say thank you for coming here and speaking to us and giving us a lot of insight of what you had to go through back in the day. And my question is, um, were you ever scared of the unknown of fighting for civil rights? And if so, what were ways that you um, con or combat those thoughts? Well, not at Morgan, because when we were doing the sit-ins, people didn't want to know about it. 
It wasn't widely publicized. It was a quiet thing, and each lunch counter was desegregated individually. So when we desegregated Kresge's, that was not very well publicized. And that is why when I spoke to Dr. Jones and told her that we desegregated Kresge's in about 1952 or three, it wasn't in the archives of Morgan. And no one knew it, and I wanted to correct that history, which I did. Now, moving on to being scared, not at Morgan, it, we, we did it peacefully, and there were no incidents, but we, were, we got results. But later years, I was inspired at Morgan. I was in Mississippi as a volunteer with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and I was chased out of Marks, Mississippi with a shotgun by a sheriff. And he told me to get out of here, nigger, nigger, or I'll blow your head off. Yes, I was scared. That was the time. All, that was the biggest time. I, there may have been others that I don't recall as well, but certainly that was the time when I was scared. How going despite the fear? Well, I don't know. Tenacity, uh, I would say really probably just knowing that the job needs to be done and who is not thou, I would say. I would say, yes. Thank you. Let's just give a warm round of applause thanking the interviewers and interviewees. You know, Honor is the currency of elevation, and we can't continue to strive forward unless we acknowledge those who paved the way for us prior. So we are so grateful to have you here to share the knowledge and the experience that you faced with us, and hopefully we can apply some of those tips that you gave us to our lives to continue to become better versions of ourselves every day. Um, and at this moment, I'd like to invite to the stage Dr. Walter Gill with a special presentation as he represents the Pi Omega chapter of Omega Psi Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Oh my, can I just say, I was a member of Pi Omega, and Walter, I know, uh, I've known him since he was, uh, um, you know, <laughs> I won't tell him how. He grew up on the campus. He was, he, he was not a student then yet, but he lived here, he was here, taken along behind his father. So my goodness. Well, and I, I greeted him earlier, but I was a dedicated member of Power Omega until uh, driving up to Baltimore became, you know, quite a chore. But yes. All right. Yes, and I, okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, good morning. I'd like to thank our Brother Donneville for sharing his experiences. And on behalf of Pi Omega Chapter of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity, I'd like to present my Brother Donneville with an old school hat. <laughs> it's old school because it looks kind of raggedy. <laughs> on purpose. And I'd also like to present him with or yesteryear, which is about the first seven decades of Power Maker Chapter. Now, I'm giving it to him with my gloves on because I wrote the book, and whenever I uh, autograph the book, I always make sure that the person who's buying it or receiving it, his fingerprints are on it first. Wow. So that's what. Well, I, I, <laughs> I like to say something about uh, yesteryear about Powell Mega Chapter because it had a strong connection with Morgan and Pi Chapter. Of the first seven decades, the first 36 Basilei, at least half, had a Morgan Pi Chapter connection. There were 13 students who were initiated into Pi Chapter. There was also a strong staff faculty connection. 
James Carter, George Grant, Edward Wilson, we have a building named after them were Basili. Um, Howard Cornish, before he became Reverend Howard Cornish, was a Basili. He has an alumni chapter, MSU alumni chapter named after him. Dr. George Balding, a chemistry teacher, when he was a student here, he placed second in the decathlon and the pen relays, and he inspired thousands of students to go into the medical field. So there's a lot of history uh, in the book. I think his favorite chapter will be chapter five, which is 1950 to 1954, when he was here. So he'll read a lot of names that he remembers. So again, thank you for your presentation. Enjoy wearing your cap. Enjoy reading about Pi Omega, and may peace be with you. Thank, thank you, Walter. Thank you. Um, uh, before we hand over to Mike, as we are closing, again, we want to thank you guys for coming out. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a quick shout out to all my student leaders in the building. Thank you guys for coming out and being here. And students in general, um, our interviewers, we want to thank them as well, Professor Sheed. Ship, I'm so sorry, forgive me. <laughs> Professor Ship and I just see Sid. I messed up both the names, forgive me, please. Uh, but just give them a round of applause for just being able to have this conversation. Um, and at this time, we would like to pass the mic to Dr. Ida Jones in closing remarks, which will be followed by uh, Cameron Potts as he sings our alma mater. Thank you again for having me. You guys have a wonderful day. Good afternoon, everyone, and I want to thank you as well. This is the first of the future of Black History Convocations here at Morgan, so it's uh, Convocation Unbound. I want to thank Professor Shipp, as well as all the professors in global journalism, and Ms. Sid, who was so excited to be doing this and to be a resume builder for her. I want students involved in this. It's time for my generation to kind of mentor from the stand, so that's my entire point, as well as our Mr. Morgan, Mr. Julianne, who just basically got the script this morning. So thank you so very much for all you've done. I also want to thank Dr. Richard Bradbury and the uh, library for their support of this, and their coming out and supporting us as well. And I know there are Quarles family members in the audience. If they can just wave their hands, we'd appreciate the Quarles family members that are in the audience. They're in the front row here. And uh, no? No? OK. Well. <laughs> Okay, well, they're redirecting me. So we're, we have a lot of kinks. We're getting them out. So please let your faculty members know. Please let us know on social media whether you like this new Unbound convocation. We're going to be doing more student involvement because it's your turn to be next. You all got next. So it's time to make you do that. So thank you so very much.